So a very warm welcome to the Summer Academy for Pluralist Economics. Um, I'm Luca Coco and I'm going to do the moderation for tonight. Um, but before starting, I just want to give you a brief outline what's going to happen tonight. So, um, well, as I said, um, this event of tonight, you, you might be a participant of our Summer Academy, so you might already be familiar with it. But if you have joined through other channels, I just want to let you know that this is um, part of the evening session. We also have workshops, um, 12 different workshops, and they address different topics um, of pluralist economics. And so this is the third evening program already, and we are basically in the middle of um, the event. So yeah. And maybe just to give you some quick ideas about how we, we are going to structure this. So um, you're more than welcome to start writing um, questions already into the Q&A function um, already throughout our discussion. Um, so if you have a question already now, you can do um, you can post that. Um, but and then you will have the option to upvote uh, certain questions by liking them um, with a thumbs up button and um, the most popular questions um, are the ones that I will um, pause like the, at the at the panelists here and um, but you will also be able to ask your question personally so if you would like to do so you can just unmute yourself and also um yeah share your video if you feel comfortable um however i just want to let you know in advance that we are mainstream uh, that, that we are mainstream I'm, I'm have been talking too much about the mainstream and the critique of <laughs> of um neoliberal economics so no we are live streaming um this event so this uh, your question will be recorded and also um, be shown on youtube afterwards so um please be aware of that um and so if you don't like that you can just stay anonymous or i read out your class question loud um so um now i'm very happy to uh, introduce you to our two speakers tonight um the event for tonight is called from the imperial mode of living towards an ecological sustainable future and um i'm very happy to be moderating this event and i feel think that it's particularly interesting also for the people that have already been with us yesterday yesterday we talked a lot about the sdgs and development and yeah had a lot of discussions in, in that matter and i think um, this event will add up nicely on this question that we have raised yesterday but focus more on the environmental aspect as well um but obviously a couple of other things too so um i don't want to waste much of time um explaining that because i would rather have our uh, speakers letting talk for themselves um but just to give a very brief introduction to them so with us we have professor dr ulrich brand um he is the professor uh, professor in at the university of vienna um for international politics and um yeah also part of the scientific advisory board of attack um and with the in with the institutes uh, um solidarische moderne and with the buco bundeskoordination internationalismus so but i think the the reason why many of you might already know him is the a couple of books that he's published um, and especially the imperial mode of living so i'm very happy to have you here Ulrich Brand, and um, i'm very much looking forward to the discussion um so and our second um panelist is Yvonne Yanis and i'm also very keen on having you here i think it's great um she's the founder uh, one of the founding members of acción um, ecológica 
which is one of the most popular um, environmental organizations in um, in Latin America, I think in in general. So uh, really great. Um, uh, yeah, contribution. And she's also active in multiple other ways. So the Network Ecological Depth and um, Friends of Earth and Earth International. So uh, I personally think this will be very inspiring because um, we will be able to have a very theoretical debate whilst also looking at a lot of practical aspects and um, particularly of you, um, Yvonne, Yanis, I'm happy that you will be able to um, contribute from your from your vast knowledge in, in, as an activist. So thank you both for having you. Um, maybe, yeah, just to give you a brief idea, we're going to start um, with uh, 20 minutes or about 20 minutes um, presentation uh, from Professor um, Brand. And um, afterwards, um, uh, Yanis is going to do the same. And then we I will ask a couple of questions or we will try to emerge this um, two perspectives in, an, in a nice conversation. And then we will hopefully still have half an hour for the Q&A. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And I would um, give the microphone to Professor Brandt right now. Yes, good evening also from my side. I'm very happy to be here and I start my PowerPoint. I hope that it works. Um, you should have it now on the screen. Um, yeah, many thanks to the organizers, Luca, Lars, Holger, uh, the whole organizing team, and also um, congratulations that uh, for the participants that you participate in this um, event in the summer school, but also being part of this very uh, important movement, which started some years ago, pluralist um, or plural economics, and um, still uh, needs to gain much more force. As Luca said, I was, I'm was i still a member of the Scientific Council of Attack Germany. I was all, also at the beginning coordinating um, from 2001 to 2006 the, the council. And this was a very important experience still at a time when neoclassic economics was, was still um, stronger. And now it's um, not only because um, of, um, of real development, but also because of um, such movements as you are a part of um, um, it's it's under um, not under attack, but it's much uh, it's more and more criticized. So I'm invited, as Luca said, to talk about to introduce briefly the concept imperial mode of living. We um, agreed yesterday in the um, in the first um, conversation that I will be quite basic to introduce the concept. Some of you already might know it, uh, and then in the discussion we can also deepen it. I uh, started to work with this concept. Um, together with Markus Wissen around 2010 to 2011. I will come back to this um, in my first, um, on the first slide on global problems and questions. We ask ourselves why in the crisis of 2008, 2009, um, alternatives were so weak and, and the, the, the old um, kind of strategies to, um, to foster the old economy, the very unsustainable economy um, were so dominant, the scrapping bonus uh, so-called Abwrackprämie was one of the major examples for Germany and Austria. And we are now happy that the book is um, going to be published in English um, at beginning of next year. We just sent our proofs to the editor, this verso, and a Spanish and Portuguese version will come up uh, this, um, our fall um, for, for Yvonne, then it's, um, it's, it's a spring or in, in the South of uh, um, America. And, and we have also translations into Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and other languages. We are very happy. And then I hope also that we get, and this is also why I'm very happy to be here with Yvonne, to, to, to get a dialogue, to engage into a dialogue with others from other experiences, what is the imperial mode of living uh, about. So I stop here my introductory remarks. I just want to mention that I find it quite interesting that you are voting what are the best questions? So it's also kind of a competition, but we will see how, the, how it uh, works. Uh, for the first time I have this, um, Luca is laughing. So what I want to do in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes is to, to 
um, set a bit um, the starting points of our argument, what are global pressing, pressing problems and questions. And then um, I saw that you had last night a, a, a debate on the sustainable development goals. I have only one slide. Um, my take uh, of the sustainable development goals, we elaborated also a bit in the book uh, I just mentioned, and um, um, it's open for discussion. It's it, um, only some thoughts. And then in my uh, main, uh, the main part of my talk, I will introduce the concept in Real Mode of Living, and then I have also some thoughts. This is the last chapter of our book, the solidary, uh, what we call the solidary mode of living. I won't deal explicitly with the corona crisis, but I can, for those who read German, um, I can uh, um, recommend, if you like, a book which was just published on post-growth and counter-hegemony, where I have a, a chapter on the corona uh, crisis. It's also, you can download it for free from the editor's um, website, the Faust Verlag. So what are some pressing problems? One I already said is that despite the crisis and the high politicization of the crisis, the, the, the problems of neoliberal uh, globalization, um, the um, liberal globalization, um, financialized industrial capitalism uh, went on 10 years ago. And then we had a new round of austerity politics. Um, you all know about Greece. We don't, uh, or, or we also I should mention um, countries of the global south where um, powerful forces, powerful economic and political forces were able to, to regain their supremacy. Now we have the corona crisis. I won't um, um, elaborate on that, but just one brief um, distinction. I think it's still an open question whether we go uh, on with what I could or what we could call currently a form of crisis Keynesianism, whether we will have uh, um, in some months um, a new round of austerity politics, which already in countries of the global south um, starts. Yvonne can talk much more about this, or whether we have what we call a post neoliberal constellation where we have also some social ecological options. This is a thought, an opening thought on the corona crisis. What we still have, and all the studies show it, um, it's a still overproportional use and access to the global resources, by, mainly by the global north, which is highly exclusive. I will um, elaborate on that um, when I come to the impairment of living and the unbroken attractiveness of what we can call the Western way of life, or in my words, the impairment of living, which, and this is very important also politically, which is very ambiguous because it's also very productive. It, con it, it, it creates a lot of material wealth. We would say in a critical, um, uh, here in, in our critical um, as spaces, which uh, it it's, does not make so much sense, but we have to acknowledge that within society, it's still very attractive to have this growth orientation, uh, productivism, consumerism, and so on. And the last starting point, which is very important, and this is why we also sh uh, should engage in a global dialogue. I just got also the um, the, the, the greetings from, from somebody from, from uh, Uganda. Um, um, there is a very strong mechanism, what we call a crisis externalization. Politics, public debates, but also, of course, economic uh, strategies and processes that, um, that uh, uh, um, have the rationale that crises don't take place in countries of the global north or even in the, in the centers of the country of the global north, let's say Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, but are externalized to other parts of Europe. Greece, Italy, and uh, Spain, or, um, of course, then to other parts of the world, to the global south. So this, um, this struggle over crisis externalization, it's not a, it's yet a main part of our argument, but I think we should elaborate and think much more about this. I forgot that I remember with um, Yvonne of the Global Working Group on Alternatives to Development, the Development Imperative, um, organized by Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, the Brussels office, and we, we um, also um, try to, to coin a bit this uh, debate. So then some thoughts about, uh, or in um, concluding, I was not able to be present last night, but maybe you can engage or you want to engage with this um, um, because um, on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, because this um, prepares a bit my main argument on uh, the imperial mode of living. So what I find interesting of the SDGs, it's not just greenwashing. This would be, from my perspective, 
um, um, a false interpretation of the SDGs, but it's also, we sh shouldn't overestimate this. But I would say that the SDGs um, 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 agreed upon exactly five years ago, since September of uh, 2015, show a strong dissent among the elites. We have still the business as usual, the Trump, Bolsonaro, fossilist industry fraction, we can call it the brown economy, sorry for the mistake on the, on the presentation, versus the greening of the economy. Uh, the greening of the economy is not enough, it's still under a capitalist uh, rationality, Yvonne might also talk about this, but at least for alternatives, and I elaborate this in my, in, in my recent book in German, um, for more emancipatory radical alternatives, it's important to think in, in certain alliances with the green economy uh, fractions, the political and economic fractions. And, but my point here is that there is a dissent and we should, we should understand this dissent. However, the, the main uh, weakness of the SDGs is, I would say, as a political scientist also, the political model behind the SDGs is that if the governments, the states create an, an adequate framework, the adequate political conditions, there will be enough incentive for the households, the consumers, if you like, and the producers um, to green their activities. But this is not enough. I will come back to this. My main point is that this model is just not true. It's not realistic to think that if the, uh, the states give uh, enough incentives and if they create the framework, then the market actors, the private households and the, the, the companies will, will behave adequately. I leave this contradiction, we probably had this debate yesterday out, but um, my point is here, um, the SDGs are not willing or not able to tackle with the root causes of the structures of global and social unsustainability, inequality, and the growth imperative and others. This is what I call the improvement of living. So what is needed is much more social and political mobilization out of the societies and not to leave the initiatives at the side of the governments, um, because if this is the case, the SDGs will remain toothless. This is a, 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 a very um, brief thought. So I come now to my main argument of this um, evening or for um, even in Ecuador, the, or many of you in Latin America or in North America, the, um, the afternoon session, what is the core idea of the imperial mode of living? Please read always the imperial mode of living and production. It's not only the living at, at, in a sense of consumption, but the living in a, in a very broad sense, how we interact, how us, our social relations organize. So I quote from, a, from an, another book or an, an article, which is the core idea of the imperial mode of living. We aim to understand both the persistence and at the same time crisis deepening patterns of production and consumption that are based on an, in principle, unlimited appropriation of the resources and labor capacity. It's not only resources, it's also the cheap labor of Eastern Europe, of countries of the global south, but also the cheap labor of the capitalist centers, often in both of the both of both the global north and the global south, and the disproportionate claim to the global things like forests and oceans. So this main idea means that there is a principle that uh, the capitalist patterns of production and consumption ca can access cheap labor and cheap resources via the world market. We refer to an other, to an elsewhere, anderen Orts in German, um, where um, the, via the world market, the, the dominant economic actors can uh, refer to. And against the neoclassic assumption that if there's enough growth, we will have the famous trickle down effect that at the end, also the poorer people or the lower middle classes are better off. We show uh, with this concept of the imperial mode of living that this mode of living and production is highly exclusive. This mode of living and production meets the other side of the coin, the elsewhere the bad, the dirty industries, the um, resource extractivist countries, the mining industries in other continents to reproduce uh, itself. Of course, the imperial mode of living has a lot to do with strategies, 
and with uh, uh, with discourses, the strategies of the capitalist strategies um, 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 of the firms, of the private firms that are under um, conditions of competition. If we think in um, closing up the apparel industry, um, the electronic industry, but also the, the raw materials. So it's an economic, these are economic strategies and competition. It's also, um, the, there are political strategies, free trade agreements. There is currently a free trade agreement um, um, negotiated between the EU and the Mercosur uh, under, the, under the presidency in the EU of the, German, of the German government. And this means that the state public policies or what I name in other parts of my work, the international states is, um, creating the conditions via free trade, via investment security, so-called investment security, to, um, to, to reproduce the dominant uh, economy. It's about neocolonial politics also, um, with a political, with an, with an economic um, dimension, also with a cultural dimension, if you think in racism, yeah, in the, the devaluation of people of countries, of regions, of other parts of the world with a ra racist connotation, it's also there. It's a culture, but it's also, of course, constantly produced strategically. And since we are here also in, in, in an academic surrounding, not exclusively, but also we should al always refer to science research development that is also um, um, uh, trying uh, overall. Of course, we have at the edges alternative thinking, but overall to reproduce this. Um, imperial mode of living. There are discourses like progress, development, good living. You had Aram Ziai um, yesterday in the evening talk, who is one of the, in the German speaking world, also internationally, one of the post development thinkers. Many, many of the thinkers come from Latin America, Gustavo Esteva, uh, and others. And our point is analytically and politically, beside the strategic and discursive elements, to look at the everyday practices. If, and the everyday practices, we do it theoretically, for those of you who you know him, Pierre Bourdieu, uh, Andreas Reckwitz, and others, um, and, and, and a practice which is not the free choice of the neoclassical thinking, but the practice which is embodied, which is, which is a habitus, as Bourdieu uh, called it, which has to do with status, with success, which is deeply embedded in our uh, society. So we argue in the book and in two chapters that uh, the imperial mode of living exists since colonialism. And we could even argue that the, the Roman empire was um, kind of um, part of an imperial mode of living, but we want to understand capitalism, ca capitalist modernity, if you like, or not so modernity. And uh, we argue that uh, during capitalism, um, the imperial mode of living was mainly reproduced from the bottom, uh, 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 from, the, from, the, from the top, the strategies of capital, of states, um, and it was kind of lived mainly by the dominant classes. Um, during the Industrial Revolution and luxury consumption mainly, uh, uh, the, the products that came from the Global South, from the colonies, um, um, converted, um, think about coffee houses in Vienna, yeah, which is a very good example, how the, um, the imperial mode of living was kind of also inscribed into um, uh, everyday patterns and of course, politically, economically um, um, secure. But then we argue, some of you might be familiar with regulation theory, uh, the famous book from Michelle Alietta from uh, 1976 or then in English 1979, the founder of regulation theory, uh, Lely Pies, uh, uh, Robert Bouillet and others who, uh, who showed with a very sophisticated approach that Fordism, post-war capitalism um, created a new and very attractive mode of production and living. That the imperial mode of living was kind of universalized despite all class differences, gender differences, but it was kind of, it became an experience among the wage laborers. And this is very important for, also for today, for strategies uh, today, how, how can we change this without being arrogant with the wage earners, with the masses, if you like, or with the, with the population to say, so you are living um, in a wrong way, you consume too much. But to consider um, that the impairment of living has these attractive aspects, yeah? To use a cell phone, to be able to fly to, of course, depending on income, yeah? 
um, that I have a world reach, a certain world reach, and that I can live and reproduce in field of it. So we have to understand this um, ambiguity, as I said at the beginning, of wealth creation and um, of um, um, environmental destruction. So I just make a short point here and then I come to alternatives because I want to stick to my 20 to 25 minutes. The imperial mode of living in our interpretation was in a sense um, universalized despite all differences. Please have this in mind in countries of the global north after the second world war. But then now with the, uh, with the if you like, the globalization process, the, the, the different phases of globalization, the, um, uh, the impairment of living is also um, uh, inscribed into uh, countries of the global south, yeah? mainly among middle classes. That it's also, of course, you, there was a peripheral Fordism in, in, in Latin America, in Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, where also middle classes had already cars and electronics. But now, since the 1990s, this uh, impairment of living is rapidly, dynamically inscribed into countries of the global south. Um, with even um, um, larger disparities and inequalities, but we have to acknowledge that now in China, maybe 300 million people live the imperial mode of living. Yeah? And what does it mean politically, or what does it mean for the progressive governments in Latin America? We discuss this um, all the time in Latin America, that the progressive governments deepened resource extractivism and resource extractivist strategy uh, uh, until after the 2000s, Hugo Chavez, Evo Morales, Rafael Correa, uh, but also um, it was accepted by many people in those countries, Venezuela, Bolivia, or um, Ecuador, because it enhanced for a part of the population, for the middle classes, the, 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 their living conditions. And what does it mean politically? So it's not a copy of the impermanent of living, but it's, um, it's kind of an assimilation in other countries. So to finish this um, uh, brief introduction, what um, we think in the book, but also in other works, um, how can we push, promote a social ecological transformation that goes beyond a capitalist ecological modernization? There is a lot of debate on uh, environmental politics. There's the European Green Deal. There are many Green Deals now. Um, but the question is, if we have a global perspective and a perspective of, of, um, of the um, the, the deep ecological crisis, we have to overcome the imperial mode of production of living, what we call the solidarity mode of living. So we have to acknowledge that there are processes of ecological modernization, but for sure that are not enough. Not enough. Yeah? We have the rebound effect, we have um, the, the, the problem of eco-efficiency and so on. This will be not enough. We have to reorganize social relations and most of them will be post-capitalist. This is, I would say for sure, and what we can discuss. So what we need um, is to, not that we do it from the desk, writing books, but to look into society, to look onto struggles that are uh, going on, onto, uh, onto contestation. And one uh, very prominent concept developed in the last years is the good living for all. Coming, the semantics coming from Latin America, uh, from the Indian countries, um, and Yvonne, I'm sure, will talk about this. And this is a very important principle. And this needs to be articulated with a profound questioning of the capitalist, economic, and also socially organized system. A system that puts growth and profits first. Yeah? The exchange value, if you like, in, in um, economic terms. The exchange value that predominates the, um, the, the, the use value. So, and the principle of care, and we can see this very, very uh, 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 good in the corona crisis, a principle of care could be an alternative to the principle of progress. And not only the care principle in the sense of caring the elderly, caring the children, but to care for society, to care for nature, to care for ourselves, this could be an attractive uh, alternative. And to to um, uh, outline the main thought of our proposal, I was also a member of an, uh, of an enquete commission, expert commission of the German Bundestag from 2011 to 2013 on a growth, well being, and quality of life. And there I learned how the um, 
the, the concept of well-being is not per se an emancipatory concept. It's also a very liberal or a very conservative concept. And this is uh, why we argue in the book with many, many others, um, the degrowth um, 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 uh, uh, groups uh, uh, folks and, and others, is that we need another form of well-being. Another form of well-being which uh, goes beyond the profit orientation of the current system. And there is, I would say, a good message that even in countries of the global north, in the countries of the global south, it's even more, or in Latin America, but in the countries of the global north, that we have already a lot, a, a, a lot of good examples. We have, we know what how social ecological food systems should like. We know how and the the automobile centric transport system could uh, be replaced by uh, by a transport system that is mainly uh, um, um, that mainly bases on public transport that reduces everyday mobility the so-called forced mobility and so on. we know how cities should develop beyond the capitalist growth and rent imperative etc so the idea again is um, a reorientation of the society, of politics, of struggles around um, the, the use value, how pr products and services are provided. For this, I'm not per se against private initiatives. Um, um, I'm not, um, I, th I think that the, these are good. The problem is when private, uh, the private economy converts to a political power, when the, the companies become system relevant. But uh, what I want to stress here is, um, um, also, how can we think while being differently um, that a strong and democratic public sector is um, a precondition of other forms of well-being. And this is also what we can learn in the, um, in the current um, corona crisis, that a health system, an educational system, a transport system that is publicly organized is much more resilient to this form of crisis than a privately organized health system. I, uh, Yvonne could tell you two hours uh, about the situation of Ecuador, the health situation in Ecuador, um, the, the catastrophe, what is happening there when people, most people don't have um, um, uh, access to universal health care. So, and this, I, um, I finish with this, um, and I'm also convinced, and this is an also my bridge to, um, to Yvonne, to Acción Ecológica, to all the struggles in um, Ecuador, the, the very emblematic struggles taking place um, uh, last um, uh, October um, against neoliberal politics from Lenin Moreno, um, that conflicts, emancipatory conflicts, uh, emblematic conflicts will be key. We should not um, trust into politics. Of course, we need at the end also politics and we need um, changing rules, but um, I think that the conflicts coming from the bottom emancipatory conflicts are key. So I leave it here and I thank you very much for the attention so far. Thanks a lot, Professor Brandt. Um, I would head over immediately to Yanis uh, so that we can save some time, but thanks a lot and we will discuss that afterwards. You have to unmute yourself still. Yeah. Okay. Can you listen to me now? Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Uli. And thank you also, Lars and uh, Luca, with uh, I have been in contact during these days. And um, I will, uh, in 20 minutes, try to explain how from Ecuador, uh, we understand this imperial mode of living, but also other ideas that I think that could be complementary to this, to this idea. And of course, I apologize because my, my English is not probably so good, so I will speak slowly. Uh, and uh, if I have uh, any um, problems to express myself in English, I will probably try to look for one word in Spanish, but anyway. I will do my best. Uh, I am Yvonne Yanes uh, from Acción Ecológica from Ecuador. This is an environmentalist organization that uh, from uh, 30 years ago work on the defense of the peoples and nature in Ecuador. 
but also in alliance with other networks and movements in the country, in America Latina and internationally. And uh, I was asked by Lars and Luca to, to talk a little bit about, um, uh, about uh, what this imperial mode of living is uh, seen from Ecuador, but also how to think uh, about the question of an alternative, um, for example, an ecologically sustainable future. And how could it look uh, like this? And for that, I will divide my presentation in three parts. Uh, the first one has to do especially with this imperial mode of living itself and uh, the societies in the South. The second part has to do with uh, how do we understand this and how we see the conditions that this uh, could be. Uh, for example, the relations, economical relations or social relations uh, from the North and the South. And uh, finally, uh, the third part uh, has to do with the critics of the concept of alternatives and how we understand from Acción Ecológica of what it means a sustainable ecologically future. So I will start with the first part and um, how we see from Ecuador the imperial mode of living. And um, taking the words of Uli, this idea of desire, uh, not only to, to consume, but the, this desire to, to be or to, uh, um, to be like, like Europeans and also to be like other countries like the US. So I think that this, and I, and I am a little bit critical of this because um, when we think that the imperial mode of living could be uh, established also in the middle classes in America Latina, particularly in Ecuador, uh, uh, together with this desire to be part, to be like the American way of life or to be like the Europeans, etc., is not necessarily like this. And why I will I, I, why I say this? Because uh, I think that um, we have to to understand historically of what we are talking about. And when I say historically, I am going to refer to what uh, the Peruvian animal, Aníbal Quijano used to, to talk, eh, la colonialidad del poder, the coloniality of power, that uh, introduces uh, the invention of race from the Europeans in, in America Latina as the fundamental part of the, of the societies in, in our continent. And what this means, this means that the aim or to desire to be like the Europeans or the American way of living or whatever is not necessarily linked with this part of uh, production or consumption uh, regarding to the other. For me, I think that this uh, American way of living linked with the race materializes not the aim to be the other, but materializes the rejection of what we are. And this is linked with the race, of course. So it's not to be European, but it means not to be Ecuadorian or not to be Indian, in Indio. So it's for me, uh, and even I think that probably um, Uli is also using a little bit of a Eurocentric point of view, to think that we are want to be like them. No, what probably we want to do is not to be what we are. And of course, this is an imposition um, through this coloniality of power that Aníbal Quijano um, um, elaborates very well, linked with the race. And of course, uh, this idea of the progress of modernity, etc., uh, is also a question very important in the coloniality of power. For example, in the case of Ecuador, during 10 years, we have the Correa, Rafael Correa government, and he uses very cleverly this, uh, 
it is a complex that we have in America Latina. Of course, created around the idea of race, inferiority of race, the invention of race when the Europeans came to our countries, our continent. And the moment that the progress and the modernity is like something that we feel that we have to be denying what we are. It was very, very well used in the case of Rafael Correa, for example. And what we what he made is like to say, okay, the Ecuadorians, we are proud because we have the best team in the world in soccer, or because we are, we have uh, one um, um, woman that used to play chess and she's a master of whatever um, competition. So I think that, and this, this idea to, be, to not to be and to be at the same time helps him to impose um, a model of development that was looking for exactly to be modern and to be uh, uh, in the middle of this progressism. So I think that this is this is something important that we have to understand as um, the imperial mode of living and how it, it is um, materialized in our countries. I don't know if it is clear or not. But for me, it's difficult explain this in English, <laughs> but I think that is, is quite clear. The other thing that I wanted to, to talk with you is about these conditions that the imperial mode of living needs to be, what it makes it possible to be. And of course, uh, and Uli already mentioned that a moment ago, it could not be without the looting of, uh, of the in countries in the South. It could not be without the dispossession of rights and territories in the South. And also, of course, uh, it could not be uh, without the destruction of nature locally and globally, for example, climate change. And of course, it could not be without the subsequent flux of materials, humans, and money from our countries to the North. And uh, and I want to emphasize a little bit about this idea of the money and, and the humans, because it's not something that you, you, you from Europe are importing um, oil or minerals, etc. But also uh, the humans, the, 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 the humans that work in, in the care uh, labors, as uh, Uli mentioned, uh, the, the, the humans are, that are living in Europe working from America Latina, giving love to the children that are taking care. I mean, it's also an, in, an import of materials, but also an import of, uh, of blood and imports of care and imports of, of blood and imports of love uh, to, to Europe. And of course, regarding the money, I was reading that, for example, Africa uh, has an external debt of $365 uh, billion. One third of this is with China, but the rest is, is with the Northern countries. And when, when we talk about external debt, we are talking about cash, money in cash that are being taken from our arcs and bringing to the um, arcs in the Northern countries. Uh, and I, I was also going to mention something, but more like a, a question to Uli, and he already mentioned something that I wanted to say, is what uh, what uh, uh, is the role of China in this moment, in this imperial mode of living? Not inside China, that 300 million of Chinese want to have a big car, no. But what is the relation of America Latina with China regarding this imperial mode of life? I think that this could be a good discussion that we can have later. Um, another thing that I wanted to say is um, regarding of uh, some uh, interesting ideas that um, also Uli mentioned that uh, that, that uh, now are very like uh, uh, well known and promoted in Europe. For example, this idea of the uh, universal basic rent income, I think that is called. How this universal basic income that the European countries uh, are, 
with which I am, I am totally agree. I mean, I think that this is a very important demand, but how this could be related with this continuous flux uh, flow or of materials, uh, humans, and cash. I mean, the universal basic income will be based on a continent without these uh, flows of uh, humans, materials, and cash. What is the relation with this? I think that we have to talk about this also. And also remembering that we have, uh, you have, you are the, the debtors of an ecological and historical debt with America Latina and other con continents, Asia and Africa also, of course. So uh, I think that it's not important to forget uh, this uh, before to talk about this universal basic income. Uh, finally, uh, the third part of my presentation uh, has to do with, uh, uh, you asked me to, to talk about that this, uh, this ecological sustainable future uh, as an alternative for the imperial mode of living and uh, as an alternative of this destruction and, and uh, all the crisis, environmental crisis in, in the world. And I will start first talking about this idea of alternative. Uh, I think that um, the concept of alternative um, uh, appear, appears the moment that uh, there, there are options. For example, uh, they are options. You say, okay, my alternative I will take this one because I think that is uh, the best one. But the problem is that uh, when, for example, uh, a government want to impose a project in an indigenous communities, they create these options uh, and they create this dile dilemma for the indigenous communities and say, okay, do you want to be uh, a territory with oil and then and disappears the other options and they say and if you don't want this which is your your alternative so i think that this is a false dilemma because for the indigenous peoples the oil mining agrobusiness or whatever project are we talking about there is not an option at all so the alternative doesn't really exist for that and of course, they are forced to say, okay, my alternative to oil is this, our alternative to mining is this. It's like, it's like to force them to create the option that this destruction could be possible. And of course, the people, when they say, okay, we are living uh, as campesinos, we are living as uh, fishermen, we are living as uh, agricultores, leader uh, farmers, and we don't want this other option that you create no, the government do not pay attention to them. So the alternative could be a tricky and could be a tricky and could be a trap for the peoples. Uh, last year I was in, in Brazil and it was difficult for the people to say, but the alternatives exist. The alternatives is something that we have to give. And I use a, a, an example like a metaphor saying that, for example, uh, when a woman says no, uh, and, and you have, you are in the front of a, of a raper and the woman is she saying, no, no, no. And, the, and the, this, this person that want to abuse sexually uh, to her, ask her, okay, you're saying no. So what is your alternative? So for me, this, this comparison is very clear in the case of the territories, because it's to say, okay, you don't want me to, to violate your rights and to destroy your territory, so give me an alternative. So for me, uh, this, is, this is very dangerous in a certain way. And um, continuing to this idea of the ecologically sustainable future, and with this, I am going to finish. Uh, I wanted to, to ask to the, to the to the person that uh, uh, written this question uh, for the photo for the for this event, why are we talking about 
a an ecologically sustainable future. For me, there is not one future. Are we talking about the future of Austria? Are we talking the future of Europe? Are we talking a white future? What future are we talking about? Even we cannot talk about the future of humanity because humanity is a, is a universalist concept. And we know that uh, Europe is not universal or, or, I mean, we are talking about so many futures. The number is, as, is the same that as many as peoples exist in, in, in the planet. So it depends, it depends of each people. It depends of the Andean peoples. It depends of the European, even in Europe, there are so many different uh, nationalities and, and different peoples. So we cannot talk about uh, one only future, even if it is ecologically sustainable. For example, in the case of the Andes, and I always mention this, for us, the future, the past, the past for us is in front of us. So when we talk to our future, we always walk with our past in front of us. I don't know if this is the same in other, in other parts of the world, but for us, this is a, a way to see the future is always seeing the past. So of course, for so many peoples, the future could be different. No? And also uh, regarding this ecologically sustainable issue, what this means, I mean, we know that sustain sustainability, sustainability is, a, is a concept that uh, the environmental economists invented. And of course they invented, link it with some uh, uh, concepts that we rejected and should be rejected, like the terms of resources, uh, they talk about the extraction according to the rhythm of regeneration, but uh, they, I mean, what regeneration of what? Of a population of an animal or of a plant or what? Uh, another thing that the environmental economists re related with sustainability invented is this idea of the limits. I mean, the standards, the limits, the natural limit. Who, who says what a river has as limit, who says uh, which animal, uh, in terms of the population of this animal, has a, a limit to be destroyed. For me, this is, this is something that we have to reject also. And of course, uh, another thing that is related to this is this idea of renewables, non-renewables. I think that the border between these two things we know already is completely confused and we have not to use any more this because for me, every, everything is non-renewable. <laughs> so we have to, to, to think that this idea of sustainability could be linked with these terms that we have to reject and not use them anymore unless we are going to criticize them. And finally, uh, I wanted to say that uh, we would like uh, from Ecuador or from Acción Ecológica to instead to ask this idea of what is this econo ecological sustainable future look like, to put besides this question and to ask other type of questions. For example, how we dream or we imagine different territories how we dream or imagine or strengthen different type of lives of, uh, of peoples. Uh, how do you invent a different way to relate, to reinvent, because uh, you know this, to reinvent invent the relation between humans and natures. Uh, how do we learn from the indigenous peoples to see our possible future for our society? So I think that uh, we have to think about these uh, this, uh, uh, ideas differently, completely different, because it, we could be uh, repeating and reproducing the same Eurocentric uh, way of thinking, and of course, uh, avoiding to look for the solutions to confront this imperial uh, way of living. And, uh, in Ecuador, we have a, an important base, uh, for example, with the constitution as a, as a national state. But because we are a plurinational and multicultural country, uh, we have also many different indigenous peoples that have their own, with quotes, 
ecological sustainable future point of view. Like, for example, the Causa Xacha of the Quichua, the Sarayaku indigenous peoples. Or, or we had, for example, the, the Yasuni proposal that was uh, uh, corrupt and also uh, finished by Rafael Correa. But I think that also from America Latina, other ideas are, are being now in the arena of the discussion. Like, for example, this social ecological pact that is a sort of, uh, you know, um, point of view regarding the Green New Deal or the European Green New Deal or whatever it is, is uh, happening in, in, the, in the US and in Europe. And this pact, the social ecological pact from America Latina, is an invitation also to other countries, to other peoples to discuss, okay, you are thinking about this ecological sustainable future, for example, through this Green New Deal, but we from the South, we are seeing the things differently. So it's an invitation also to discuss uh, globally what we are thinking about uh, the problems and how to solve this uh, in terms of territories no? and peoples. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, with this, I'm going to finish and thank you very much. And sorry if my English was a little bit confusing. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I really enjoyed, um, yes, your um, input from both of you. And um, I think it was very inspiring. So I don't regret that it took up a little bit more time <laughs> than um, I was hoping for. But I think we can all also engage in a conversation through the um, Q&As. Uh, and maybe I'm just going to run over five minutes or so. But I do want to pause you one question um, before looking into the Q&As. And um, I really ap appreciate that you, Yanis, um, pointed this out with the uh, multiple pu futures. Um, it's actually um, yeah, quite funny because we've had a long discussion about it and we've called um, the Summer Academy. Um, uh, actually, I'm, <laughs> I don't know. Um, multiple ways and or multiple futures um, and multiple sustainable futures, um, but it wasn't in this in the title for this discussion. And I think it's very good actually that it is not was not so. Um, we can hide use that um, as a highlight because I think um, there are a couple of things that I think you raised both of you in your analysis, and I think you. Both of you made it quite clear and pointed out what the cr current crisis is and that um, from a very holistic um, approach also at times very intersectional. So, um, and I think that's very fascinating and um, makes it also more compelling. Um, and I think what is also very interesting is that you, at the same time, while not only criticizing, but that you already um, outlined slightly what direction this should go to. Um, I, however, would like to press you a bit more into this idea of futures and in terms of um, who, so, um, a combination of two questions. Who are the people who are driving for change? Or, um, uh, Professor Brandt, you already said that this was something that was supposed to come from below. And I assume from you, Yanis, from your work that you might have um, a similar approach. But I would like to get a more clear understanding in terms of what the difference is between um, yeah, an individual position and a more communitarian approach for change and the danger of universal uh, essentialism, maybe. Also, with reference to Spivak, I'm not sure if um, we really want to go into this question, but uh, can the subaltern speak? And who can speak for whom on behalf of what or in what circumstances it makes sense to have a coalition or if coalitions are actually feasible. Um, so yeah, I, I would love if you could outline this idea or this discrepancy between 
the global and the local and multiple futures and how to unite, who's driving the force. I think I've been talking a lot and I'd rather um, give the microphone to you and um, maybe uh, um, Professor Brandt, you just start and then um, uh, Yvonne Yanis, maybe you could jump in uh, afterwards. Um, so thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you for this question. I would also um, refer briefly to Yvonne's um, talk. Thank you very much, Yvonne. This is a pleasure, like always. Um, yes, of course, my perspective is Eurocentric. But then the question, because this is my background, my, my experience, um, and I, I'm very happy that I know you, that, I'm, that I know something from Latin America. My point is that I try to reflect on my Eurocentrism. And this is why I claim that we need dialogue. And I'm very happy that you refer to Quijano. We always refer in our book to Quijano, the, the link between racism and um, the, the um, division of labor. Yeah, this is his very important argument. And I like very much that you say, this is also um, the basis for a culture of rejection. And I, this brings me forward. We don't have this. Um, I didn't think about it in this way. And I find it very, very good. Um, I don't go through the points, but, but just briefly. Um, the um, condition of the care work, yes, there is um, also an import, if you like, of work. You mentioned care work. We could also say with um, Alf Hornburg and others, that his concept of ecologically uneven exchange, that the work and the products that are exported from Latin America or from other continents to the global north, there's also labor embodied. Yeah, and this labor is work, um, is not it, yeah is miserable or is much less paid. And this is Hornbach's argument um, through the um, terms of trade argument, and, and he puts it also to the ecological side. The question of China, maybe we can elaborate it afterwards. I would say yes, Yvonne. This is changing a lot, and in Latin America is with Africa um, um, a top example. Um, yeah, this is a top geopolitical and uh, economic issue. And I just remind for, the, for this brief round, uh, what Alberto Acosta, a common friend of us in Quito always says, he says, maybe at, in one day at one point, we will be happy that before the United States were our counterpart in the North, because at least there we had a critical public that we could criticize, that we could develop alternatives like um, fair trade or some standards, ecological and sustained standards beside all imperialism. And now in China, the, the way is even um, much more um, authoritarian, brutal, um, and, and we have to understand this even better. And my last point, and then I come to uh, Lucas' question, the basic uh, universal basic income. It's interesting that you say it, Yvonne, because in the um, Pacto Eco Social or, or uh, Socio Ecologico uh, from Latin America, the universal basic income is an issue. And I, we discussed it some weeks ago with um, the, the protagonist, um, Maristela Svampa uh, and, and others. And, and I was surprised and I agree very much with you, Yvonne, that if we claim a basic universal income or universal basic income, it needs to be rethought with the imperial mode of production living. And if not, it remains um, uh, something, not luxury, it's also part of struggles, yeah? but. Um, it remains something embedded in an imperial global division of labor. And I think it's, it's an important entry point, as you said, Yvonne, but we have to rethink it. What does it mean also to reorganize global production and, uh, uh, and, and, and living relations? And with the alternatives, I completely agree. Um, this this um, false dilemmas, this is a very powerful aspect of development thinking uh, and others. I, I don't go into it. So the question of... Um, uh, who is driving it? Um, I'm always very tentative and, 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 and a bit hesitant to answer this clear cut because it depends on a very careful analysis what we are talking about. When we talk about resistance against free trade agreements at a global level, maybe we need also some alliances um, with progressive economists and progressive governments. But if we talk about very concrete local uh, relations of exploitation of a gold mine or, or whatever in, in, in Ecuador or Peru, the constellation is different. So I think, of course, but this was um, already your question. It's not a question that the individuals should do it. This is a very neoclassic um, mainstream thinking. If everybody consumes green, we will do it. We will get it. This is bullshit, of course. I, I think in this surrounding here, it's clear. 
But um, and communitarianism, I would be very careful because this often um, uh, um, does not reflect on power relations. It's an under, it's an idea of community which in many respects doesn't exist anymore, but in some parts it exists. So my point would be, we have to think about alliances in a very concrete sense, and we cannot um, respond to this very complex and very important question in, um, in, in, a, in, a, in, in a universal sense, as you said at the, at the um, end of your question. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I assume that uh, you have enough to respond to, so I would not like to put any, give any further input. Um, so to you, Yvonne. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Luca. Um, well, I think that um, I would like to make a short comment about this idea of crisis and the new crisis with the COVID. Uh, because uh, also I think that probably there is a different um, uh, understanding of the problem of this crisis that is part of many crises together. Uh, um, it depends of who is, who is uh, uh, talking about this. A few weeks ago we started a series of webinar uh, just a, maybe at the beginning, just at the beginning of the crisis, maybe in April we started with this, uh, giving the voices to the peoples that have been fighting and struggling since many, many years ago against extractivism, agro-industry, all these problems. And the question for them was, what do you think about the COVID crisis? And I can swear, any, any, none of them starting to talk, start talking about the COVID crisis. So they started to say, okay, we are here, we have the mining company, we have the oil problems, we have the, you know, the agribusiness, we have all of this. And then after 10 minutes, they say, and now we have the COVID. <laughs> one more problem. And as, I mean, the, the COVID just is like one other problem that adds of, to all of the other problems that already exists in the territories. So also this idea to think that the world could be completely different and the new crisis of the COVID, et cetera. I think that this is, is relative of who is talking about which territories where, et cetera. And of course, what Uli said at the beginning of his inter intervention, here in Ecuador, we have tremendous, at the beginning of the crisis, I think that Guayaquil was the first city and all the videos of Guayaquil were going around the world, seeing the people dead in the, in the streets. Of that, oh, this was this was horrible, but I think that we have this health as a universal health uh, uh, system or uh, program here in Ecuador, very uh, with a lot of failures, of course. But one thing that we have, and we have to to recognize this, is that the knowledge of the indigenous peoples. And not only the indigenous peoples, the, the los mestizos, los campesinos, to fight and to tackle with this problem of COVID. Because at the beginning of the COVID crisis, most of the indigenous peoples flew uh, to their territories. And they flew, they, they abandoned the cities and go deep inside the forest, their territory, etc., trying to, to run away from the COVID. The problem is that the COVID was, was already there and probably they will bring in the COVID to their territories. And of course, the moment that they need to have an ambulance, we don't have a river ambulances, we don't have so many things. So they just started to develop their own way to fight uh, with their own medicines, the COVID. So I think that this, this idea to have uh, the, the, knowledge, the people's knowledge to confront and not only medicalize it, confrontation of COVID is very important and a lesson for, for the world. And not only in the Amazon, I think that in very, very many parts of the world. So this is just a, a comment about the, the, the COVID and the crisis. And regarding of uh, who is the people and, 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 uh, and from below and the communitarianism and all of these things, I think that, um, again, it depends. I think that uh, the, the, 
the peoples uh, in the territories, or when I say territories, just an, an explanation, I'm not talking only about the territories of the indigenous peoples. No, I am talking about a space where relations of humans and nature have been, I mean, taking place and could be a terri an urban territory, could be a, an indigenous territory, could be, I mean, so I think that uh, the peoples uh, need to have the chance to decide how they want to live. And, uh, and, and in this, and in this is very important, and I'm going to finish to this, is to understand the role of the states. Uh, and we have been in the discussion in the, in the group of the Rosa Luxemburg together with Uli and other people, we have been discussing about this idea of what is the role of the state on all of this? Because we have the states and we have, and with the COVID crisis even, I think that the state is also becoming stronger not only to for the health system, but also to repress the people to go, you know, to repress the people not to go out or to not to use a mask or whatever, police with police, with the military, with everything. So what is the role of the states when the people need to express and decide what, how they want to live? So I think that I'm not agree that we have to completely destroy the state, that this is the position of one of some part of the people here that are discussing this. But at the same time, we have to, at the same time, to uh, take, uh, to have a, a state with less power. In, but not as a neoliberal way of thinking, of course, we have to be careful of this, but a state with less power in the sense that to give the power to the peoples and to decide how they want to live, how they want to, to relate with natures, how they want to see and dream their future. And uh, I think that, um, yeah, this is something that I wanted to finish with. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would have lots of questions as well, but at this point I want to give the microphone to the audience. And I see that the first question comes from Sven Haas. Um, Sven, I don't know if you're here and if you would like to ask your question out loud. Um, otherwise I will read it, but maybe it would be nice for you to um, express it yourself. Uh, yeah, I can read it out. Okay. Um, yeah, these approaches sound extremely interesting and promising, especially the part from Ulrich at the beginning. But how should uh, major transformations as that work? Uh, if we do not want to get into a phase of destabilization, uh, we um, decisions must be strategically and the developments in, in many countries during Corona um, crisis show that abrupt changes uh, affect mainly the non-privileged people. So how can this be prevented? And finally, um, are we not also conducting an extremely exclusive and privileged debate here? Um, because this is not even a bottom-up approach because we are not the bottom. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I th do you have anyone in particular in mind to whom you want to pass it? Um, otherwise, I would... Yeah, it uh, was mainly meant to, to Ulrich Brandt. Okay, so then I would ask you, Ulrich, to... Um, yeah, but um, Yvonne can also um, think about this, how can a major transformation work? But I would like to um, come back to the status of the concept, because it, we agreed that it was um, much more introductory. What we want to do with the imperial mode of living concept is to understand what are dominant patterns of production, consumption, subjectivity, uh, the state, um, uh, the international uh, division of labor, and why this is kind of the level, level field to understand why is it so difficult to change it. So it's more an analytical aspect. I, at the end, I talked about the solidarity mode of living, but um, the status is um, not to go into the trap of an ecological modernization. I don't talk about intentional greenwashing. We, we should criticize that, but that even those people who, who are at the heights of, um, of a radical transformation, we, we started, for example, the German Advisory Council for, um, how is it called? Global Environmental Politics, the VBGU. Yeah? They, they coined a, an important study in 2011 a, a, a state, an advisory council of the government talked about 
a great transformation using the Karl Polanyi concept, yeah, the, the, the famous concept. There's a very radical semantics acknowledging North-South divisions, the ecological problem, the climate change crisis was not at the, this time not, not a, a, a name. So, and we want to warn in research, in politics, in the global pub, in, in the public, in public debates, that we have to think the deeply, the deep embeddedness of these patterns, of these power structures, differently as that, just to say, um, it's the state, the state should green. And then we say, no, the state is part of the problem. So this is about the status, I leave it here. And the major transformation is um, to acknowledge this deeply rooted problems, patterns, crisis mechanisms, the, um, and also um, in, in the new book, but also in other books, I, I work with the term green capitalism, that we have to go beyond a green capitalism, we have to go beyond a, a new round of the valorization of nature, uh, the, the capital valorization, but the valorization of nature, Yvonne is talking about, other relationships between individuals or in, um, um, subjects, societies, and nature, which is another valuation of nature than the capitalist valuation of nature. This is a bit the space. And then, how to transform comes. This was my in, in on my last slide. We have to. This is my proposal because if not, I would be myself would be overwhelmed to look very concretely in specific issue areas. This was my proposal at the end. If we talk about public transport in Vienna or in Austria or in Quito or in Ecuador or wherever, then we have already alternatives. When we talk about agriculture, we have the enormous imperial mode of production, industrial agriculture with, with an enormous dynamics. But we have in, in Ecuador and in Austria and elsewhere, we have these alternatives. And this would be my take on the transformations, not the transformation as a singular, but the transformation, uh, transformations as very uneven processes. And my job as a researcher is then to say, okay, if we have well-intended people to shape the agriculture in Austria towards an ecological agriculture, to insist that this has a global implication. This is then my job, yeah? At a very concrete level, that it's not only to import uh, food stuff, um, ecological food stuff for animals, but to rethink what are the global relations. This is this. just to, to, to finish this. I like very much Yvonne's intervention on the COVID crisis. My argument uh, in, in, in the book is also uh, this crisis is probably dealt with uh, with the old power structures. Yeah, I use um, the, the Naomi Klein term of Corona capitalism. Corona capitalism means that it, in line with the old power, the, the existing power structures of the health industry. Um, the Gates Foundation and so on, they try to resolve, resolve the crisis. But we have ambiguities, we have learning potentials. Yvonne talked about the state. Yeah? The state from the neoliberal perspective is just the, the guard uh, to, who, who, who assures property rights. But now we have the very ambiguous experience of people that the state is repressive, but the state also can do something and can even shut down the German automotive industry, which is not little. Yeah, so these learning process, we I have others in the book, but, but I leave it here to, to understand the learning potential. And this would be, this would, might lead to major transformations. But what I don't want is to tell from a desk, even I, I, I know many things, but I, me or as a group, our alternative group and, and the, the Rose Lux Foundation group, we cannot tell. We just can reflect concrete experiences and think what are the potentials to, to push further and what are the dangers, the traps we can go into when we don't consider, for example, the North-South relations or gender relations and other relations? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think the next question um, is already partly answered and or you, have, you have it partly answered already. So I would read it out immediately and... Um, Put, uh, put it to you, Yvonne Yanis, to, to answer it maybe so that we can save some time and give um, more space to people to ask a couple of other questions. So um, money rules the world and states may have lost influence over financial markets. S see the HSBC scandal or, or speculations during the sovereign debt crisis. 
what are your policy proposals for a sustainable financial system and how to implement a change in the international finance, how to give power back to the state and what should they do with that power? Are green bonds greenwashing? So these are a couple of questions and maybe if you want this, um, also a bit that you want to incorporate into the, um, from the last question, you can do that. Gracias, Luca. Uh, I will start with the second part. Uh, I think that instead to look for a sustainable financial system, we have to dismantle the financial system. So we will, uh, we need to not to reform the financial system, but we need to, to disempower it, but at the same time to start to dismantle it because it's part of the, of the problem, no? We know that the financial system is now controlling more and more the economy and we have to, to reverse this tendency and to, to start to, to give uh, again the economic power to the people no? and not to the banks. And this, this is something that I wanted to mention. And yes, and regarding the first question that is a very important and long idea of this uh, transformation, <laughs> transformations, I just wanted to say that uh, it depends. It depends uh, of, the, of the place that we are um, talking, from we are talking. In, in our case, in my case, in the case of Ecuador, I think that uh, any transformation should be seen uh, with, three, with three axes that cross together. The space, the time, and the relations. The space, because it depends on the territory of uh, we are located when we talk about transformations. If we talk uh, with the people that lives in a territory affected by all activities, probably they will, say, they will say the transformation for us is to see restore the river. The transformation could be uh, that I can uh, wrote again my food and the transformation means that the company leave the territory. For example, just just an, an example, no? and the time. Uh, I remember always when we uh, I, I work a lot on climate change, and the people say we have to take the decisions now because we are going to die now, everybody, because of climate change. And I mean, the time the time is relative. I mean, for the for the peoples in their territories, the time. They are not to accept any uh, uh, solution to climate change related with market because they are going to die now. They are saying, okay, what we need is to stop, to think, and to say, okay, how, is go how are we going to recover the climate in a good climate in our territories? First of all, we have to close the gas flares. So very concrete and very simple things that people have as solutions to their problems. And this is related with time. They will say, okay, we have to close now the glass fairs. And then in the future, we are going to see how we are going to recover the climate in our territories. Just an example. So the, 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 this, this um, relativity of time, I think is very important. And the relativity of where where are we located when we talk about transformations? And finally, this idea of relations. Uh, the relations, uh, we, we always talk about harmony to recover the relations between nature and society, etc. But from the Andes, we, we always think in a different way. I mean, in a way that I will share now that is very simple. We always think about the complementarity, the complementarity between all the beans that exists in one particular territory. The, the beans means in, including the, the stones, no? So the second principle is the reciprocity. I mean, when I give you something, and it's very simple, when you receive a gift from someone, you have to have this reciprocity and give this person also something. Or if you are invited to eat in the house, you have the the obligation to have this reciprocity to invite this person to your house is the same with nature. I mean, between the peoples and nature is the same. If I took 
something from the earth, I have to give back something to the earth to have this reciprocity. And of course, the harmony. But other thing that is very important to, to think is that uh, we have to be um, in a correspondence between uh, the peoples, among the peoples, among the, the, the peoples and natures in one particular space, in one particular time, and of course, to strengthen this relation. I, I just, I'm going to finish. I remember that um, uh, I was discussing with, uh, with some uh, ecological economists uh, a few years ago. They were, that they were proposing as a transformation, as a way to transformation, the, the, the coupling, the coupling, the production with the, the, the material, you know, the nature in this case. And I was saying to them, no, I think that instead to decouple, I think that we have to recouple <laughs> and to really think the production must be always think uh, related of the earth, of the territories. So if you put this in a decoupling, very, you know, a very stratospheric way of thinking, we will continue to have the problems that we are going to overexploit, to destroy, etc. So the transformation will not be possible in this sense. So, yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question is from Sergio. Um, I'm not sure, Sergio, do you want to read it out yourself or present it? Um, then you would have the opportunity. And also considering sure. having it. Okay, great. So um, having a look at the time as well, I would ask you both to um, answer this question briefly. And then maybe if you want to, you can add a, a little summarizing or a final statement to it as well, because I don't think that we'll be able to um, ask another question. So thank you already very much. Um, and to you, Sergio. Thank you. Uh, no, thanks for an excellent discussion. My question uh, has to do with the fact that it is true that there are multiple paths of progress, but at the same time, we live in an interdependent world uh, that inevitably will put external pressures on communities they do not agree with. So what kind of international order do we need to build in order to remove obstacles for multiple ideas of progress to flourish if economic, economic forces such as competition will continue operating in any case? Professor Brandt, maybe you wanna start? Yeah, this would be an own seminar. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, uh, question. Uh, you are right. I would like to stress your your problem formulation, which is very very important. That in our world, the interdependent world or the world of the imperial mode of production, living or of global capitalism, imperialism, many pressures are put on other people, communities, regions, and so on unintentionally but via market forces, via prices, via, for example, the pressure in Latin America um, through the volatility of prices of resource extraction. When the prices are high, extraction goes up because then it's very attractive. And the, if the prices goes down, it's also the tendency to go up because then the governments or the actors need even more extraction because the prices are low. So the, the um, market mechanisms, the, often the invisible market mechanisms that put the pressure are very, very important. I, I agree with this. We call this externalization, but not in the economic sense, but externalization as a very, very complex mechanism. And coming to your question, I would, um, first of all, I would say that it's not one international order which makes the rules, but we have to think it also in a, in a multiscalarity. The international order can set some rules, but then it goes through the regional, national, and local also political uh, and economic conditions. And I would argue in, in a very um, 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 general sense with a term um, coined by Walden Bellow at the beginning of the alter globalization movement um, around 2000, he coined the term of a deglobalization. And he said we need, he was then the director of focus of the Global South, a think tank in, um, in Manila, and he said, of course we have, and we need international politics. We need high 
environmental standards. We need high social standards. We need a strong regulation of the financial market that in fact dismantle um, uh, corporate financial power, et cetera, et cetera. And he says the international order should first of all be changed to, to let flourish and to let decide people at the local level and at the national level what to do. And his point was always free trade. He said the free trade agreements from, from the, the, the neoliberal free trade agreements put so much at, at, as part of the international order put so much pressure on the local, the regional and the national that this has to be first of all dismantled. So I would say we have, we can positively identify high environmental standards, high um, social standards that can really be also um, um, uh, imposed on powerful actors, not just formulated, yeah? ILO standards and others, climate uh, uh, um, rules and so on. But an international order needs also first of all, be dismantled how it is now and to give more space, to give more um, um, decision-making, democratic decision-making power to, to the local, the regional and the national levels, to, to leave it in, at, at this very general level. But have in mind and read it, if you like, it's, it's a book which came out in 2004 um, from Walden Bello with Z Books, Deglobalization, which was a very, very important intervention at this time to say, arguing to rethink the international order positively, we have to dismantle the current international order. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so Yvonne Janet, that would be your turn then. Thank you, Luca. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, it's, it's a long, uh, no. I think that if we talk about it in the interdependence, that is true, is very important. Uh, we have to think that uh, we have to think, uh, for example, from Europe, what if we have the opportunity to think this interdependence in a different way, not in terms of tones of materials being imported, not in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, millions of uh, dollars, <laughs> but to think this in the interdependence in the political, uh, in a political point of view and cultural too, of course, with respect, with uh, no colonialism, etc. So I think, that, I think that we have to think interdependence in a different way, first of all. Second, I think that uh, we have to stop the progress. I mean, we have to stop to think that progress is the objective in our lives. Progress is probably, this ideology of progress probably is something that caused a lot of damage to the peoples in the North, to the nature in the North and to the peoples in the natures and the territories in the South. So we have to stop this idea of progress. And of course, we have to be aware of what is modernity, what is coloniality, not only here, but also there uh, and in our quotidianity, every day. Every day, what of my way of living has to do with this modernity or with this coloniality? Neither ne neocoloniality, neocolonialism. I am talking about coloniality, coloniality. So we have to think this is very important. And finally, I wanted to say also that um, from the South, we always in America Latina that we have a rich discussion every time, to discuss about this idea of, of the progress, but also link it with this idea of growth. And of course, with this idea of development. We develop here, and Uli must know, this idea of the de-development. So we have to de-progress, to de-develop, and we have to, to start again. I mean, like to start again, of course, always thinking historically, and of course, always thinking that we are diverse and we have to think in a different and, and a very uh, pluriverse, pluri, pluriverse way of thinking. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have to call it a day, but I really appreciate um, this conversation that we've had. Um, yes, I I just want to want to thank you a lot, um, Professor Ulrich Brandt and Yvonne Janis for being here, for taking the time um, and for your uh, very inspiring input. Um, I think it's been, yeah, very interesting also um, 
considering our overall topic of the Summer Academy and the discussion forward to the lecture tomorrow. So first, obviously, every, the, all the participants will be in their workshops. But tomorrow we are having another very interesting talk, um, which is um, on economics and morality. So um, Lars is going to moderate this one. And um, yeah, a great thank you for, uh, to all of you for being here. And I wish you all um, a good night or whatever time it is where you are right now. So thanks a lot and see you soon. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Adios. Gracias. Adios. Gracias, Yvonne. A ti. Adios. Gracias. <laughs> Adios. Gracias. Gracias. <laughs>